for. So do take care if you are out driving because there could be some difficult driving conditions through this evening. Now we can see the strongest winds earlier today through parts of Northern Ireland, gusting up to 60 miles per hour, then affecting more southern parts of Wales down to the southwest. But the good news is those winds will be easing overnight and into tomorrow we see smaller wind hours so it should be much less breezy as we go towards the end of the week. Also, as the low pressure makes its way further away, clearing parts of England, take away all those heavy bursts of rain and should leave a clearer end to the night. And with these clearer skies, temperatures will be dipping away, perhaps down as low as 5 Celsius in some parts. Now, we'll see the low pressure well out of the way on Friday. There is a brief ridge of high pressure, bringing some more settled conditions for parts of England and Wales. But then there is another low pressure sitting to the north and the fronts associated with this will bring some more cloudy conditions later on on Friday. So for Friday morning then there will just be a few remnants from that low, the odd shower for East Anglia and the South East to start the day but then a lot of fine and dry weather, some sunshine breaking through. It really will be a much better day tomorrow with some good dry spells and then later on we will see cloud increasing in the far northwest. That will bring some rain to Scotland, Northern Ireland and perhaps into northwest England later on on Friday evening. But further south we'll keep the fine and dry weather, plenty of bright conditions and temperatures should be upper touch tomorrow, 18 or 19 Celsius. And although the wind's still in the northwest, it won't be quite as cold as it felt through today. On Saturday, we'll see that rain clearing ever southwards, but it looks like staying in a northwesterly breeze, so looking pretty unsettled as we go into the weekend. More than four and a half thousand people are missing, feared dead in the New York attacks. 500 Britons may have perished. A two-minute silence is held at Buckingham Palace. Tears of a president. Bush breaks down over the loss of life. And the result of the Conservative leadership ballot will be known in the next few minutes. Hello, this is BBC News 24. I'm Jane Hill. And I'm Peter Dobby. Good afternoon. President Bush is going to New York tomorrow afternoon to see for himself the devastation caused by Tuesday's terrorist attacks. He announced his visit during a telephone conversation with the city's mayor and the governor of New York State. The conversation was broadcast live on television. And Mr Bush used the occasion to condemn the attacks as the first war of the 21st century. In other developments, U.S. airspace has reopened and the first transatlantic flights are scheduled to leave Heathrow tonight. The British government's ban on planes flying over central London will be lifted from midnight on Saturday. In New York itself, where the twin towers of the World Trade Center were destroyed, the mayor, Rudolph Giuliani, has announced there are still 4,763 people missing. Here, the Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw, confirmed hundreds of Britons are unaccounted for. Meanwhile, there are reports that the terrorist suspect, Osama bin Laden, is now under house arrest. And in Germany, one man has been arrested in connection with the attack. Well, speaking in the last hour, President Bush said he was heartened by the response that he'd received from other world leaders. And there is universal support for the American people, sadness in their voice, but understanding that we have just seen the first war of the 21st century. And there's universal approval of, um, of uh, the statements I have made. And I am confident there will be universal approval of the actions this government takes. Joining us now, our correspondent Jane Stanley. Jane, we can see the mist and the smoke still hanging in the skies behind you. Why hasn't it been blown away? Well, there are fires just uh, burning all the time. Uh, the ash is uh, still hanging so heavy in the air. It's quite a, an astonishing sight, really, and you can smell it. It's a, an acrid, horrible chemical smell that's here, and really unbelievable to see so many days even after the, the explosions. Are the firemen fighting a losing battle if the fires are just igniting themselves all the time? 
It, it does seem to be a frightening prospect. And there's also, they're not just fighting the fires, they're fighting the constant changes in the ground as they move the debris. With these very fragile buildings, they're constantly being checked for stability. And uh, you can imagine, it's also a very hot day. It's very, very difficult and dangerous work. And things proceeding as they can, but... Uh, as we're hearing, uh, the, the toll of missing is going up all the time. Uh, 4,763 now, the mayor of New York City, Mayor Rudy Giuliani, says. So people in New York don't really know w what's hit them. I mean, it's still that terrible, terrible scene that you can see behind me, the flow of emergency workers just uh, coming to and from down this main road here, the West Side Highway in New York, normally packed with traffic. Now it's emergency vehicles only, says pretty much the state that the city's in. We'll talk to you later, I know, Jane, but in the meantime, thank you. Well, a survivor of the attack on the Trade Centre told BBC News 24 that following the first plane crash into the North Tower, people in the South Tower were told it was safe to go back inside. The second plane crashed 18 minutes later into the South Tower, where British man Anthony Gould was on the 91st floor. I think some people were just in the same mode that I was. It was just entirely a reflex response. I think anybody who stopped to think about it um, was, was looking out of the window and perhaps thinking, well, it hit, out, it hit that tower, it's not going to affect us. Um, I mean, I know that uh, other people who had started leaving their desks were being told by fire marshals and officials that our building was safe and that we were welcome to vacate the building if we wanted to, but it was fine to go back to our desks as well. Here, the Foreign Secretary Jack Straw has said that uh, he expects the death toll of Britons caught up in the tragedy to reach the middle hundreds. Speaking at a briefing at the Foreign Office, Mr Straw said up to 100 deaths have been confirmed so far. The government says it will foot the medical bill for British people who were injured in the attack and have no medical insurance. I understand that the number of confirmed British deaths is now approaching 100. And uh, although these, as I say, cannot be anything but imprecise estimates, the total number of British deaths is unlikely to be less than the middle hundreds and maybe higher. Jack Straw there, and uh, to say that the Foreign Office, to remind you that the Foreign Office has, of course, set up a special telephone helpline number uh, in case, uh, in, for anyone concerned about relatives, there's a the number on your screen, 020-7008-0000. That number again, it's a central London number, 020-7008-0000. The Prime Minister, Tony Blair, has been holding an emergency cabinet meeting to discuss the situation. He briefed the cabinet on military issues in the wake of the attack. The cabinet also heard from the Foreign Secretary on political and diplomatic efforts and the Chancellor on the economic impact. Well, we will, of course, keep you fully up to date with events from the United States throughout the afternoon and evening here on BBC News 24. Uh, but first, we do, of course, have uh, one other fairly important news story here today. The winner of the Conservative leadership race is due to be announced uh, very shortly. So let's cross over to our chief political correspondent, Nick Robinson, who's at Conservative Central Office. Welcome to Smith Square in Westminster, where the Tory party is about to hear about a choice it didn't want to make on a day it didn't want to make it. But they have to choose a new leaguer to follow the line of Thatcher, Major, Haig, someone they hope, who in this century, will bring them back to the electoral success that they saw in the last one. It seems an awfully long way off. I say a choice they didn't want to make because, of course, this has been, at times, a very vicious leadership contest indeed. And the Tories are about to hear a choice between two men. One who Margaret Thatcher described would be a disaster for her party. The other, who Michael Heseltine said, would, in effect, on that building behind me, Conservative Central Office, erect a sign saying, shop closed, out to lunch but choose they must do, and many of them have. It's a ballot the Tory party have never seen before. Almost 260,000 members have taken part, and we'll hear the result any minute now. Let me take you inside Conservative Central Office. Inside there, journalists, of course, 
waiting for the outcome there. Above them, on another floor in Conservative Central Office, a hundred or so of Tory MPs who've accepted the invitation to come and hear the result there instead of waiting to hear it on television or on radio. When we get that result, of course, we will bring it to you, as well as the speech, first of all, of the loser and then of the winner. That's all we'll hear. They then have to really get down to work, of course, because they have to, the winner, speak tomorrow in that debate that's been called on the tragic events in the United States of America. Now, often you can tell what's happened before you know the result by the demeanour, the facial expressions of those arriving. Just look now as we go and see Ken Clark as he arrived at the Conservative Central Office just a few minutes ago. Not stopping for the cameras, determined, right through that crowd of photographers. Now, a little bit later on, Ian Duncan Smith arrived. Ian Duncan Smith, a man, after all, with none of Ken Clark's experience. Clark, the man who was Chancellor and Home Secretary, Health and education too. The only experience Ian Duncan Smith has in government, in a Conservative government, is voting against it, which he did regularly against John Major's government when it was trying to bring out the Maastricht Treaty. Look now at Ian Duncan Smith as he arrives with his wife Elizabeth. Oh, yeah, it's the big back. smile back. Yeah, some room. For sure, that's the mood here at Westminster, though. Yeah, what do you want? And okay, wife, okay. Because, though, they think they're going to be in the public eye. Yeah, well, let's turn now to two men over there help us analyse this result, supporting the different candidates. Lord Fowler's here, former party chairman. Here is Michael Spicer with the results. 56,797. The voted for Kenneth Clark, 100,864. The voted for Ian Duncan Smith, 155,933. I therefore declare that Ian Duncan Smith has been duly elected as leader of the Conservative Party. Both Kenneth Clark and Ian Duncan Smith will be here very shortly. Thank you very much. There we are, Sir Michael Spicer, chairman of the Tories' Backbench 1922 Committee, announcing the result that it is Ian Duncan Smith who is the new leader of the Tory party. The peasants have revolted, many will believe, in Tory ranks, and they've taken the party over. A man who was a Maastricht re rebel, loathed, quite frankly, by ministers in John Major's government for causing them trouble, though they respected and admired him for him sticking to his view, they have elected Ian Duncan Smith. And you can see the happiness there of the Duncan Smith team. Uh, Bernard Jenkin there in the middle. He'll be very pleased indeed. He was uh, Ian Duncan Smith's campaign manager. And here's the man himself and Ken Clark, the loser too. Let's hear what they've got to say. Firstly, I congratulate Ian on his success and I wish him uh, every success in leading the party back to election victory and he'll have all our support in trying to do that. Uh, I do, of course, wish to thank all those who supported me, the 100,000 who voted for me and also all the people who put a very great deal of hard work into campaigning for me up and down the country. Uh, the, very, the hustings themselves, I think, demonstrated that the party desperately wants to be put back into a winning condition I very much hope, Ian, that you'll succeed in, in doing that for us all. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me first of all start by thanking Ken for his immensely kind and supportive comments. I look forward to working with him in the coming few years. Ken is a great Conservative, has a huge amount to continue to offer to the Conservative Party, and I know that all the Conservatives will hope and believe that Ken will give of that to the Conservative Party and he will receive a welcome response from me and I hope that that will be the case and I'm sure it will be, Ken, so thank you very much for those kind words. Let me also start by thanking the returning officer, Sir Michael Spicer, all those as well who helped organise this election, the party board, the members of staff, the electoral reform ballot service and everybody for the speedy count and all their hard work. 
And I'd also like, as Ken has too, to thank the party at large, who despite everything, despite all the adverse comment, have shown that they at least are not apathetic when it comes to elections. They will have given a lesson, I hope, to everybody that elections are important and their turnout shows that the party is alive and well and we can build on this. And finally, I would like to thank my campaign team for all their hard work and forbearance over the last few weeks. See a few smiles at the back of the room. Uh, it has been a great privilege to have worked with them. It's a great honour now that this party and its members have bestowed on me that they have placed their trust in me to have elected me as their leader. I start by praising my predecessor, William Haig, who through all the difficulties has led this party with determination, with courage and with good humour. It was a privilege to serve under him. The party I want to lead will be an effective opposition to this government. It will campaign on the issues that matter to people, the things that affect them most in their daily lives, that obsess them. These must become the things that obsess us, the state of their public services, health, welfare, education, and the environment. We will campaign on these and we will plan to take the government on over these major issues. But today is not the day for party politics, notwithstanding this election. On Tuesday, all of us witnessed a series of appalling acts which have so destroyed the lives of far too many people. What President Bush called an act of war must not go unpunished. It was not just an act of war against America, but it was an act of war against all those who share the values and freedoms that characterize civilized nations the world over. I take this first opportunity to pledge that my party will stand shoulder to shoulder with the Prime Minister and his government in supporting our friends and allies in the United States during this tragic time. Tomorrow, of course, there will be a fuller opportunity for me to express our resolve and our determination for the coming weeks and months. And therefore today, in thanking my party for the honor they have given me, it remains for me simply to offer my prayers and condolences to the families of those who have lost their lives in these tragedies and to assure them that in this matter we in the Conservative Party with me as leader will do all that we can to ensure that our response to this tragedy we will show that we are a nation united. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. Ian Duncan Smith there, the new leader, not just of the Tory party, but of course of Her Majesty's opposition. Getting elected with a margin I suspect he'll be very pleased indeed about. 61% to 39%. Overwhelming enough for him to claim that he has a mandate, not just personally, but for his type of politics too. As all Tories I suspect will be doing today, not dwelling a great deal on domestic politics there, thinking about the situation in the United States promising to stand shoulder to shoulder with the Prime Minister. And of course now he has to go, I suspect, to appoint his top team, who will be in the House of Commons tomorrow to talk about it. Now we can hear cheering behind us there. This is Ken Clark, who's just coming out, the loser. He said a few words, offered his support. Twice a looter in a Conservative leadership election. Gets into his car with his closest advisers and heads off. The Tory party have turned their backs on a man who the public say they want, who many MPs said they want. But they've decided that that is really, finally, the end of Ken Clark's political career. Let's reflect on what this all means for the country and, of course, for the Tory party as well with our guests here with us. Lord Fowler, Norman Fowler, former party chairman, is with us. Anne Whittacombe has just joined us, supporter, of course, of Ken Clark. Bill Cash is here, supporter of Ian Duncan Smith as well. Lord Fowler, first of all, disappointed. Yes, obviously, very disappointed indeed. I congratulate uh, Ian, and we've obviously 
got to try to make this work. But I think it's a great sadness that we've turned our back on Ken Clark. Ken Clark, I think, has been one of the outstanding politicians of our generation. He's got enormous experience. I think, particularly at a time like this, it puts everything into context. We've been talking throughout this campaign about the euro and the future of the euro. There are many other things, and Ken has that experience to deal with those other things. And Whitakam? Well, obviously, uh, I'm disappointed it wasn't Ken, but we have to look to the future, not the past. Ken fought a very good fight, and we all did on his behalf. Uh, but now we've got to look to the future and to winning the next election, and that means that it's the duty of every single Conservative MP and every single uh, Conservative in the country now to rally behind Ian and to make sure we win next time. The real enemy is the enemy opposite us in the House of Commons. Let's remember that. Now, the difficulty for the party is plenty of people won't be watching this result, won't care, because they've decided your party, at least for the moment, is irrelevant. If they are, they may think something else. They'll think they've turned down the person the country wanted. What would your message be? Well, we've got to prove them wrong over the next four years. Uh, we now have a period of about four years, which means two of policy development uh, and two of trying to get those policies over. That's our task now. Look forward, not back, and make sure that we win. It is absolutely now essential that we do that. I'm disappointed today. This will be the last day I shall be disappointed. From now on, I'm looking for victory next time. Bill Cash, as you march those Eurosceptic rebels through the no lobbies, you couldn't have dreamed of a day like this, could you, that one of your own would become leader of the party? Well, actually, I did, uh, because I actually thought that at the time we were fighting the battle as a matter of conscience, and it was also a matter of principle and it was about who governs Britain. But there are other matters which are absolutely essential to the future, and that is the public services and the whole question of the uh, question of parliamentary reform and the manner in which uh, we managed to defeat the Labour Party on a whole range of matters on which we are in complete agreement across the party as a whole. Some people, I have to put it to you, they'll see you here and they'll say, told you so, it really is the peasant's revolt, as I put it. What can you say to them about what a Duncan Smith leadership will be? Well, uh, if you go back to, say, shall we say, one nation politics and you think about what Disraeli said, he said the Tory party is a national party or it is nothing. And that's not nationalism, that's the democratic national view. And that is exactly what uh, the Ian Duncan Smith campaign has been about, together, of course, with an incredibly important contribution uh, that uh, is going to be made on the question of public services, which, after all, is what people are really concerned about, as we can see from the difficulties that Tony Blair is having at the moment. Norman Fowler, there will be pro-Europeans maybe watching this who may think, look, we waited four years, we were willing to hang on, we knew we were in a minority. They're simply the Tory party doesn't want us anymore. No, well, we've got to find a way. I mean, I was saying this during the meetings I was doing during this campaign. Whatever had been the outcome, we were not going to have a united party on, for example, the euro. It was simply mission impossible. We have got to find a way of living with our differences. And if there was a sort of triumphalism um, on the, the side of those who have actually voted today for Ian Duncan Smith, that, I think, would be fatal. We've got to... We've got to I think find a way forward and we've also got to start talking not to each other which we've been doing perpetually now for years but talking to the public and about their concerns and would you come briefly that has to be right we do have to stop talking to each other we do have to stop talking as if we're only concerned with europe and nothing else uh, we do have to have a broad agenda to appeal to the electorate next time now let's go and get on with it don't stop talking to each other just yet because we've got some more discussion to do here We'll bring you some more reaction here from Westminster, but first of all, let's go now to Ian Duncan Smith's own constituency. Chingford, of course, wants Lord Tebbit's constituency. Rita Chakrabarty is there. Rita. Thank you, Nick. Um, well, we're here in a bar that was due to be the venue for a big celebration in the event of Ian Duncan Smith's victory. Well, it's happened, and his supporters, I must say, were in, never in any doubt that he was going to win. Uh, the celebration, the big party has been cancelled out of respect for what's happened in America. Uh, but nonetheless, as you can tell, the, the people who are here are absolutely delighted. Uh, Leslie Finlayson, you're a councillor here. Um, Ian Duncan Smith has got a big challenge ahead of him now, hasn't he? He's got to win back those six million voters that the party lost at the last election. How's he going to do it? I don't think that's a problem. Ian is a charismatic, gentle, honest, straightforward man. He's a man of the people and he's going to take us out there. People out there are talking Ian Duncan Smith already and they're Labour Party supporters. They are sick of this lousy government and that is the man that's going to take us to the next election victory. Is that really true, though? He was a yes. man who started with a low profile, people didn't really know who he was. Has that changed in three months? Oh, it certainly has, and they'll know who he is now. 
Ian will not be backward in coming forward. He's got his country at his heart and we're going to, he's going to put the great back into Britain. Derek Mullett, you're the constituency chairman. Everyone will be wondering now about unity. There were se senior figures in the party who had threatened to leave the party in the event of a Duncan Smith victory. Well, it's happened. That's not going to promote unity, is it? I think he will bring unity. I think it's far too early for people to start talking about leaving the party. The main challenge for Ian now is to pick a broadly based shadow cabinet and then to evolve the policies which really do relate to the concerns of the man in the street. I'm quite convinced that Ian will do that. As Leslie has said, he's a straightforward, honest person. You know where you stand. He is increasingly well known and I'm quite sure he will get his message across. I have every confidence in that, that he will unify the party. And you talk about a broadly based shadow cabinet. Should that then include uh, pro people who are pro-Britain going to the Euro? Yes, I think it should, assuming they want to serve under him. I hope they do. As um, Michael Fowle said, we can't um, agree about everything, but we're certainly going to agree about the great majority of things, and this is the way we will go forward. And if I can say Ian's views are not extreme, this is just a silly label that's put on him. He shares the same concerns of the father of a growing family of hospitals, education, transport, and above all, the ever-rising rate of crime, whether the streets are safe. It's interesting you bring this uh, issue of him being an extremist up. Lawrence Wedderburn, you're a, a local party member. It's true his opponents claim that if he himself is not an extremist, he attracts extremists. He's going to have to shake that off, isn't he? Not at all. I mean, the BNP have infiltrated every single party that there is out there. And he's not an extremist. He helped me with the opening of my business. In fact, he brought his whole family along. Uh, I would not be sat here now if I thought in, in my heart that he was an extremist. This is an extremely decent man. Uh, you know, just the same vein as John Major. He's going to do an effective job. And we've got to get away from confusing patriots with extremists. Extremists are, are people who blow up buildings in, in New York. This has been a great democratic event. The Conservative Party, which has always been derided for the 30 years that I've been around, has rushed out of the traps, has voted for their man, and we've got the right man. Yeah, yeah. Clearly all delighted. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Good. And back to you now, Nick. Rita, thank you very much indeed. Here at Westminster, the Tory party is just coming to terms with what it's done. Broad smiles on people who weren't smiling a lot during John Major's time. Gloomy faces on the people who were ministers at that time. Let's see how the loser's constituency is reacting. Nick Jones is in Rushcliffe in Nottinghamshire, Ken Clark's constituency. Nick. Yes, a sense of disappointment here. Uh, I think there'd been foreboding, uh, a feeling that uh, Ian Duncan Smith was going to pull it off. Uh, but then, of course, when the turnout was so high, that led to a lot of encouragement. Now, with me are three of the local officials. Uh, Gene Smith, you're the president. Uh, what do you think of the result? Uh... Well, obviously, I'm very sad for Ken. I think he would have been a first-rate leader of the party. He's got so much experience, and he's, he's such a well-known face. Um, yeah, that's half the battle. Will you now all unite around Ian Duncan Smith? Oh, obviously, yeah. I mean, the party's the thing, isn't it? And uh, we want to get back into power. So obviously, yeah, the membership has spoken and uh, Ian's our leader now. Uh, Darren Mott, you're the party agent here. Obvious disappointment, but clearly I think the whole exercise and this massive turnout of 79%, uh, has that encouraged you? Uh, very much so. I think most of us were uh, somewhat nervous before this started about what the turnout may be. Uh, and I think the fact that it's got up to 79% is fantastic. It shows very much the party's membership is engaging in the political process. Uh, and I think it does now mean that we can build around Ian's leadership uh, and take things forward for the future. Um, Martin Southers, you're um, a, a lifetime friend uh, of Ken Clark. Back to your Cambridge days, you're a county councillor here. How do you think he's going to take it? Well, Ken will take it philosophically in his customary laid-back style. Obviously, he'll be very disappointed. Uh, and as we are, all of us are here, but uh, like my colleagues, I think the party will now unite behind Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, I'm glad that Ken achieved 40% of the vote. It shows that the shadow cabinet must be really inclusive to unite the party because I think he well understands 
that it's a great gamble electing him with the view of public reaction, but I think he will be able to unite the party and take forward. Do you think that uh, Ken, will be, Ken Clark will be prepared to serve under Ian Duncan Smith? What's your own hunch about that? I would think that is unlikely. I mean, Ken has served in so many offices of state. As you said in the last parliament, uh, it is difficult when you have served uh, in high offices of state to shadow one particular minister. I'm sure he, will pre be, he would prefer to be a very active backbencher attacking this government as it deserves to be attacked. Uh, so finally, uh, to you again, Jean Smith yes. as president. Is that going to be the message that uh, Ken Clark's going to be up there still, though, uh, still punching for the Conservative Party, oh. although not leader? No, I mean, he's, he is the heavyweight in the party, and OK, he isn't leader. I'm looking forward to him continuing to fight in this seat, and uh, we've celebrated his 30 years last year as MP for Rushcliffe, and I'm sure he'll go on for many years to come with all our support. Uh, so there you have it, Nick. Uh, Rushcliffe putting a brave face on a disappointing day. A lot of brave faces having to be put on here. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. Yes, we're still outside Conservative Central Office. If you've just joined us, remind you of the result. Ian Duncan Smith is the new leader of the Tory party and uh, of the opposition, of course, with 61% of the vote. Ken Clark has been turned down for a second time, 39% of the vote he got. Lots of excitement and tension here at Conservative Central Office. Let's see what a couple of MPs and a former MP now commentator made of this result. Quentin Davis is here, supporter of Ken Clark's. Edward Lee was backing Ian Duncan Smith. Matthew Paris, of course, commentator in the Times, but one-time Tory MP. 39 It seemed at times like a, an election, the way it was presented at least, between the unelectable and the unacceptable, and they've chosen the unelectable. No, well, that's, of course, complete nonsense. And uh, both, both of them are supreme political uh, figures. And um, uh, Ken, of course, is extremely well known. Ian has been an outstandingly successful Shadow Defence Secretary and Shadow Social Security Secretary before that and will make an extremely vigorous, effective leader. And I think the party will have no difficulty at all uniting behind him. He's got a clear mandate, as you say, over 60%, but Ken Clark, uh, with 40%, got a very honourable um, result as well. And I think so nobody loses any face over this, and we can go forward really um, very happily on both sides. You can unite, you say, but we know that you have very particular views on Europe. You're a pro-European and regarded as such. If he picks up the phone, he says, come on, Quentin, let bygones be bygones. I want you in the team. What does he have to do to get you in? Well, I mean, I, I'm not going to answer that question hypothetically on your programme, clearly, but the fact of the matter is all of us, I think, will, will have a common determination to support our new leader. And um, I, nobody has any personal animus against Ian Duncan Smith, far from it. He has a respect universally in the party. But and I think he won't have will you, not, you will insist that I must be allowed to keep my views even if I'm on the front well, bench. Well, both, both candidates during this uh, election, leadership election, made that absolutely clear that there would be respect for conscience uh, and that uh, when a, if and when a referendum were to come, uh, then it would be possible for, a candidate, for members of either team, if they formed the government, uh, to leave and campaign for that. Edward Lee, you were upstairs. You heard the results a while before. What we did here. Um, what was the reaction upstairs amongst Tory MPs? Well, delighted. And uh, I think it's very encouraging what Quentin says. The party's now going to unite. And uh, whoever people voted for, they're going to unite uh, behind our new leader. Ken was very said gracious. That when John Major was elected and when William Hague <laughs> was elected. Well, we have now got a very hard job to do. And uh, Ian, I, in my view, I've always supported him. I think he's a very dynamic personality. Mm -hmm and he will lead the party from the front because he sums up what the party is about and his views are the views of the party and uh, we're going to now unite behind him. It's a great step forward. They've not just chosen people, Matthew, they've chosen different styles, different brands of conservatism. How significant a choice do you believe they've made? It's very significant in, indeed. Uh, this leadership election really saw the divisions within the Conservative Party made flesh. Uh, Kenneth Clark represents a different Conservative Party from Ian Duncan Smith. Now, what you're seeing here is the way Tories generally behave in public, which is like gentlemen. Ian Duncan Smith and his people will be magnanimous in victory. Uh, Kenneth Clark, uh, very courteous in defeat. Behind the scenes, I think there's considerable bitterness, considerable tension, considerable resentment, and I don't expect everybody now in the Conservative Party still to be in the Conservative Party within the, uh, in four or five years' time. I think that Steve Norris is right. I don't think there's going to be a big split. I don't think anyone's going to walk out. I think part of the party will sadly walk away shaking its head. You're shaking your head. I, I'm sure that Matthew's wrong about that. I'm afraid that journalists are always looking for trouble. I mean, it's an occupational disease, Matthew. But I take you on a bet Let that you'll be absolutely wrong about Quentin that. Davis. Just behind us, we can see there the winner, Ian Duncan Smith.
and his wife, Elizabeth. Cheers, but boos too. I suspect those are not from rival Tories. They don't tend to boo in public. They just stab each other in the back in private instead. No, I think we're seeing members of another party there. There is an image that you will see, maybe not on the front pages, given the dreadful events in America, but certainly in the inside pages of your newspaper in the morning. Ian Duncan Smith and his wife, Elizabeth. He's got quite a task now. He has to go inside, he has to settle down, and he has to decide how he will handle a huge test for any politician facing a debate in the House of Commons on the possibility of war. Now, no man in one sense could be better suited to that task. He's a former army man himself, of course, a former shadow defence spokesman as well. His father, of course, fought in the Second World War. Smithy was known as a fighter pilot. So Ian Duncan Smith may not find it as hard as some would do to do that task. Well, he's gone inside now, and I suspect one of his first tasks will be to appoint a new shadow cabinet. Because, as well as him having to speak in the House of Commons tomorrow, a shadow foreign secretary. They don't have one. Francis Maud doesn't want to serve. We'll have to face Jack Straw to kick off a debate about the activity in America. Well, we heard Matthew Paris's analysis of what all this means. Let's turn to our political editor, Andy Marr, who's been watching. What do you make of it, Andy? Well, I think the first thing to note is the scale of the change that's happened in the Conservative Party, Nick. It was only ten years or so ago that the Maastricht rebels, people like that, were seemed to be a small group on the outside of the party, the edge of the party. They now control the party, and that's an enormous move in the Conservative Party. Then it was about 500,000-plus in membership, about half that voted now, and, of course, it's out of power. So the first thing, clearly, that Ian Duncan Smith has to do is to radically extend his appeal. Very interesting, I thought, just now, that he mentioned public services, health and education, didn't mention Europe at all. Now, first thing he has to do is to bring in some of those very hurt and bitter people who are wringing their hands at the moment. Now, some of those were the key figures in the last Tory government. What are they going to be thinking as they're watching and listening I, this? Well, I thought behind the smiles and the polite handshakes and stuff, a lot of hurt, a lot of bitterness. I did not agree, I have to say, with Ian Duncan Smith that Kenneth Clark's words were generous or warm, particularly. Um, he did the decent thing. Um, and he behaved properly, but he was clearly pretty cross and pretty upset, and I think a lot of other people will be too. The trouble that they face is that if the task ahead is difficult for one Conservative Party, it is impossible for two Conservative parties. Somehow they have to swallow their anger, swallow their hurt, and work with the new leader if the Conservatives are going to make it back. Or simply walk away. Some will walk away. Um, partly it's a question of age, um, but I think it's very important for the whole Conservative Party that not too many do that. Andrew Marr, thanks very much indeed. Well, there we have it. We have the result. We have a new leader of the Tory party, a new leader of the opposition. Who can quite believe it? We remember those long nights in the lobbies of the House of Commons as they rebelled on Maastricht. The peasants have revolted and they've taken over the Tory party. Hello, good afternoon to you. This is BBC News 24 with Peter Dobby and Jane Hill. Times 5.36. Time for a look at tonight's headlines. More than 4,500 people, including 500 British people, are still missing in New York. President Bush is going to the city tomorrow to see the devastation for himself. In a conversation broadcast live on international television, George Bush condemned the attacks as the first war of the 21st century. And he pledged that the US, in its retaliation against the attacks, would lead the world to victory. And there is universal support for the American people, sadness in their voice, but understanding that we have just seen the first war of the 21st century. And there is universal approval of um, of uh, the statements I have made, and I am confident there will be universal approval of the actions this government takes. Well, he later spoke to reporters about the attacks, during which he was visibly upset. I think about the families, the children. Um, I'm, a, I'm a loving guy, and I'm also someone, however, who's got a job to do, and I intend to do it. And um, this is a terrible moment. 
but this country will not relent until we have saved ourselves and others from the terrible tragedy that came upon America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. President Bush there speaking in the Oval Office. Well, meanwhile, the biggest manhunt in American history is underway. The FBI says it's identified as many as 50 people involved and the hunt has been extended worldwide. German police have arrested a man believed to be an airport worker in Hamburg. A police spokesman said that the man, who is of Moroccan origin, had been detained pending further inquiries. The authorities also detained a woman and a young child. Police said that two of the people suspected of hijacking aircraft lived in Hamburg and were enrolled as students there. It's reported that Osama bin Laden, the man suspected of masterminding the attacks on America, is now under house arrest in Afghanistan. A spokesman for the Taliban embassy in neighboring Pakistan is believed to have confirmed the reports initially made in the Pakistani newspapers that Osama bin Laden was being held in Kandahar in the southwest of the country. But the reports are being treated with caution in both the United States and also here in Europe. Well, some news uh, away from North America. Four people have been arrested today in connection with the murder of the teenager Stephen Lawrence. Two men and two women, all understood to be in their 40s, have been detained on suspicion of perverting the course of justice. Stephen Lawrence was stabbed at a bus stop in Eltham in southeast London in 1993. Police have arrested 12 people suspected of having been involved in the riots in Bradford. The suspects were identified by members of the public after the police released 60 photographs from CCTV footage. About 100 officers were involved in the raids today and the police said more would follow. Well, let's return now to our main story here on BBC News 24. Uh, American airspace, you'll remember, was uh, closed 